Six teams, 39,000 nautical miles, nine ports across five continents. The Volvo Ocean Race is the world's premier sailing challenge. And this edition would be the closest race ever. Ahead lay nine months of agony and ecstasy as the fleet made ready to depart Alicante on its ocean odyssey. But the first chance for the world to see the fleet en masse came in the Iberdrola import race. Conditions were light and shifty as the boats headed towards the start line, but Group Hama, Camper and Abu Dhabi judged their time on distance to perfection. Three, two, one. Camper are in a great position, and then to windward of Camper, Abu Dhabi are, really, are looking very strong and well bow forward. By the first mark, Abu Dhabi and Camper held their advantage. Puma had overtaken Group Hama, but was forced to dip behind the leading boats and rounded in third. After Mark II, Abu Dhabi opted for the more stable Code Zero, whilst Camper and Puma stuck with their Jenicas. Abu Dhabi extended its lead over Puma, who rolled Camper after the mark. As the wind filled in, Abu Dhabi was flying, throwing down the gauntlet for the rest of the fleet and crossing the finishing line more than 14 minutes ahead of Puma, scoring the first points of this edition of the race in the process. The Emirates flag is flying as Abu Dhabi hurtle across the line, handshakes all round, a great win. Alicante to Cape Town. To be honest, we didn't get very far. We had a little hole in our plans. Alicante to Cape Town. We knew there'd be blood spilt. We decided to go on a little vacation. The opening leg of this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race, the first of nine, took the boats from their home port of Alicante to Cape Town, following a traditional trading route seeking out trade winds and crossing the doldrums. His Royal Highness Prince Felipe was on hand to start proceedings as family and friends bade their loved ones a fond farewell. A lap of the import course and it was time to head for the high seas. The weather forecast promised a difficult opening night for the Volvo Ocean Race fleet. We were very much of a mind that this is going to be a very long, hard night ahead of us. Very fast in two places. Take down the long way away right now. We just fell down a hole in the sea and when we came off the back of a wave, the boat fell. It was pretty much weightless feeling. We landed, uh, landed at the bottom of the wave and, and obviously all the rigging loads up when you do that. And uh, something let go and there was a loud bang. An incident-packed first night, but the drama wasn't over yet. Back with Team Sanya, all was not as it should be. It felt like we just ran into thick mud, you know, and um, at the same time, big shout from on deck, you know, check the bow, check the bow. Feels like we've got a lot of water on board. Sure the guys were safe. We had Andy in a bunk with a broken leg, so we had got him into a survival suit, got the guys out of their bunks into life jackets. We sort of got the pumps ready. We, you know, we, we pretty much almost got ready in case we had to abandon ship 
quickly. With some kind of hole in her bow, Sani was forced to pull into the closest deep water port and decide what to do next. Abu Dhabi had salvaged its broken mast and sails, turned around and motored back to Alicante. The sailors, we're all just gutted, but I think, um, you know, everyone's just relieved nobody's hurt. These are dangerous boats. This has always been a dangerous race, and, uh, and we've just been reminded of it. The other four boats in the fleet continued on. There was no respite from the tempest in a challenging opening 24 hours. Sanya had pulled into the Spanish port of Montreal and with the boat hauled out, the full extent of the damage to the hull was evident. The team realized how lucky they were not to have sunk. The boat would be shipped to Cape Town, where the shore crew was hard at work constructing a replacement bow section. After the muscle flexing of the first few days, it was time for some serious strategizing amongst the Volvo Ocean Race fleet. Light, fickle conditions were giving the navigators a headache as they studied the weather and debated which route to take across the Atlantic. It was decision time. Hug the African coast or head west towards South America. Group Armour chose the southern coastal route. Puma and Telefonica headed west, whilst Camper started to go south before changing their minds and following the majority. Back in Alicante, Abu Dhabi had fitted their new rig and were soon on their way once more, but unsympathetic weather gods and the fast rig turnaround were preying on the crew's minds. Gutsy but heartbreaking decision from the Abu Dhabi team deciding that discretion was the better part of valour. Time to turn the boat around and retire from leg one. In the Western Atlantic, the fleet's focus was on the only waypoint of leg one, the archipelago of Fernando de Noronha. And still there was little separating Puma and Telefonica. Palmer now snared up in the doldrums and camper almost 150 miles behind, the scene was set for a fascinating duel. First blood to Puma as they rounded Fernando de Neuronia ahead, but their delight was short-lived. A small but significant error from the Americans allowed the Spaniards to take the lead and then disaster struck. Long 23 knots of breeze, reef, jib, staysail, and, uh, and the mast fell over the side. And the bottom line is our leg's over. Uh, we're still 2,300 miles away from Cape Town. We are under jury rig heading that way. We're assessing all our options. And to say that we're disappointed uh, would be the understatement of the century. With Puma now out of the equation, Camper had moved up to second place and was enjoying some exhilarating sailing conditions. But while preparing for a sail change, Bowman Mike Pamenter was hit by a wave and washed down the deck, knocking a tooth out and suffering a nasty gash to his lip. Onboard medic Tony Ray had to patch him up and fast. The crew slowed the boat as Tony Ray began the delicate process of suturing Pamenter's lip. The closest landfall for the wounded Puma was the remote island of Tristan de Cunha, where they docked and were forced to wait for a lift via a container ship to Cape Town. As the Americans bided their time, Telefonica was within sight of Table Mountain and far enough ahead of Camper to appreciate the breathtaking scenery surrounding them as they charged across the finish line and claimed the maximum 30 points.
For me, it's a great feeling. It's the first regatta I've sailed as a skipper, and it's a big responsibility. We're super happy. The truth is, there is no better way to fight for overall victory than winning the first leg. The boat worked really well, as have the team. Everything went really well. I'm very proud of all of them. It was a rough ride into port for camper with Emirates Team New Zealand, 16 and a half hours behind Telefonica. Second place and the opening leg, a result they were more than happy with, considering their indecision at the exit of the Mediterranean. As for Group Armour, Lady Luck had left the building. Stalled by light conditions, the French boat eventually sailed into Cape Town almost three days behind the leg winners. And then came the container ships. Sanya, Abu Dhabi and Puma all arrived in Cape Town late and the race was on to get the boats ready for the V&A waterfront import race. Against all the odds, all six teams were indeed present and correct on the import starting grid. Telefonica stormed into an early lead as the boats at the windward end of the start line got a jump on the rest of the fleet. But by the first mark, Puma Ocean Racing, despite resolving to take things easy with their new rig, rounded the mark in the lead. Well, there's a bit of a change. I guess that was positioning and crew work there, that uh, this is the man who was going to be conservative in this race. <laughs> by mark three, all six boats were separated by just 100 seconds. But earlier, kite troubles on board Puma came back to halt their charge as first Telefonica and then Camper eased past them, heading to Mark V. The Spaniards' love affair with Cape Town continued as Telefonica added victory in the V&A waterfront import race to their leg one win. And you can understand the celebrations. Fantastic race by Telefonica. And they haven't put a foot wrong. Great start. Surrendered the lead briefly, got it back and have never let it go since. Leg two, Cape Town to Abu Dhabi. Back on the road, back in the game. We like to follow our own path. Team Sanya, the storm chases. Dancing through the dark, it's a dangerous game. Well, we were heading home for some New Year celebrations. The fleet left Cape Town for the 4,500 nautical mile voyage to Abu Dhabi. The boats would sail to the Maldives before being loaded and shipped to Sharjah to eliminate potential piracy risks and then race along the coast to Abu Dhabi. It was a case of slow, slow, quick, quick, slow as the fleet danced its way along the African coast and out into unprotected water where it came up against its first strategic obstacle of the leg, a large front in the Indian Ocean that was proving difficult to break through. Group Armour chose to take matters into its own hands, diving far to the south in an attempt to get around the front as opposed to trying to break through the trough line. In this situation, there was no... In that specific situation, I don't think I was taking a risk because there was the trough which was restricting the progress of the entire fleet. So you can go off 200 miles to the south without losing any ground to the east because you are always on the same longitude as the others, even if we had a lot more distance to travel behind the trough. With Group Armour already going their own way, choosing to race the weather as opposed to the fleet, Team Sanya decided to roll the dice and go north towards a fierce storm system to seek out faster conditions. The gamble appeared to be working, sailing in a more consistent breeze, Sanya charged into the lead, but it was by no means easy going. At the moment, we're just about to sail into the strongest airs. 
me is about 35 knots at the moment, so hopefully it's not going to increase too much more. Just when it was all going so well, Team Sanya's fortune changed. We're going for a sail change and uh, David Rolfe is running a lured sheet for the new fractional zero and uh, looked up in there the, the D2, the piece of rigging that comes from the mast um, to the bottom spreader um, was flapping in the wind and um, unfortunately that's the end of our race. Uh, keep going, Richard. Sanya's only option was to limp towards Madagascar to attempt to repair their mast. The rest of the fleet had finally made it through the front with Group Armour leading the way. As the boats entered the doldrums, the French team, Puma and Abu Dhabi, all on a westerly heading, slowed dramatically. Behind them, Telefonica and Camper were able to avoid the worst of the light airs, turning further to the east and moving into the lead. Well. The final phase of the Maldives involved weaving around a multitude of small islands. It was a head-to-head -head battle between Telefonica and Camper, negotiating the dual dangers of atolls and reefs, as well as each other in total darkness. We were within uh, you know, shouting distance and um, Telefonica, you know, I could hear KP, a nervous voice going, you can't go in there. <laughs> I think, unfortunately for them, they sailed into a hole and we just sailed around them. The difference, just two minutes, and it was a second consecutive offshore leg win for Team Telefonica, staying just ahead of Camper in the overall ranking. It's a great boost in confidence. It just makes us feel uh, a little stronger um, going into the next leg. At the safe haven port in the Maldives, the shore crews had gathered to supervise the loading of the precious and fragile cargo. Getting the boats onto their floating fortress was no simple manoeuvre. With all the boats transported safely to Sharjah and back in the water, all that was left was the final dash to Abu Dhabi and the end of leg two. Telefonica got the jump on the fleet in the early stages, whilst Camper and Puma kept a wary eye on each other. But as the fleet started reaching, Group Armour mounted a charge, storming into the lead. Group Armour finished first, collecting a much-needed six points, whilst Telefonica in second dropped only a single point on the entire leg. But the most eagerly awaited arrival was that of Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, the first boat to sail into a home port in the race. So many people and the fireworks and uh, friends and family and yeah, just great to be in Abu Dhabi. In the Etihad Airways in-port race, Puma Ocean Racing led the fleet over the start line in an 8-12 to 12 knot breeze, but that lead was short-lived when the crew was penalised and forced to execute a penalty turn. And that will put them uh, probably at the back of the fleet, we can see no boat speed, spinnaker on the deck. That's a very costly uh, penalty against Puma. Home favourites Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing made 30 seconds on the rest of the fleet and was first around Mark 1. Ian Walker's crew was determined to give a good showing to the watching crowds and Azam had lost and then regained the lead by Mark 2 from Rupama and never looked back. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing is about to cross the line to win the Etihad Airways in-port race of the Volvo Ocean Race. Ian Walker, what a hero. Leg three, Abu Dhabi to Sanya. How far? Let's go. And Azam, the sprinter of the fleet on home water. That was not the best start, but uh, we solved the problem. No risk, no reward. Leg three, we were heading home. Leg three began in the city-state of Abu Dhabi, once again bypassing piracy zones by container ship. The route travelled past Sri Lanka and east through the Malacca Straits before turning to the north towards the final destination. 
All eyes were once again on Abu Dhabi during the first stage sprint to Sharjah and the waiting container ship. But initially it seemed unlikely that the Emirati boat would be able to thrill the partisan crowd twice in the space of two days. Telefonica stormed into the lead with Group Armour and Puma chasing hard until a sail handling error cost the Spaniards the race. Azam best place to take advantage of the mistake. Meanwhile in Madagascar, Team Sanya had completed its repairs and was starting its journey to rendezvous with the rest of the fleet currently being unloaded in the Maldives. It was back to business for all six Volvo Open 70s reunited for the restart and ready to do battle once more. After initial problems with Telefonica, causing them to drop back to an unfamiliar last place in the fleet, the group converged at the tip of Sumatra. Heading into the Malacca Strait, the body of water separating Indonesia and Malaysia and the main shipping channel connecting the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the boats had to decide whether to head for the Malaysian coast and rely on land breeze or stay towards the middle of the strait. Telefonica opted for the middle whilst Camper hit the coast and stopped. Puma dropped back after snagging a fishing net, and with them out of the equation, temporarily at least, Group Armour had a more pressing issue close at hand. The blue boat was back with a vengeance. The battle between Group Armour and Telefonica for first place was swiftly moving towards a resolution. So Puma did what Puma does and took a chance. There's a big shift out to the right, but we pay a heavy price to get there. Uh, we have positive current all the way up. The guys down there have negative current. Uh, we go more miles. Um, but they have to short tack along the beach of Vietnam. So, the, I mean, there's all kinds of risks and rewards all over the place. Puma's plan initially appeared to be working as the black cat bashed up wind, but their gamble would not pay off. All of a sudden, the breeze just shut off. Big leftover waves, and literally the boat wouldn't move. And it's like, oh, no, this is not. And you knew right then and there, this was a bad situation. Once again, Team Telefonica led the fleet home, a feat made all the more remarkable by their troubles earlier in the leg. Three legs raced so far, and the Spanish team had made history by taking all three victories. Their lead over Camper would be 15 points. As for second place, the ever-improving Group Armour claimed that honour less than two hours behind the leaders, and in the process, reducing their deficit to Camper to just nine points overall. Over the following two and a half hours, both Camper and Puma Ocean Racing crossed the finish line. And as night fell, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing came home in fifth. But the biggest cheer greeted the keenly awaited arrival of Team Sanya the following evening. Yeah, welcome, Sanya. Welcome, Sanya. For Team Sanya, it was a rock star style welcome home. In the Sanya Haitang Bay in Port Race, Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing and Camper looked strong off the line as the fleet headed for the left-hand side of the course. Sanya was late to the start and opted for a different tack. Telefonica crossed in front of the Chinese boat, picked the shifts and snatched the lead from Abu Dhabi, holding it around the first mark. Beautifully judged by the Spanish boat as around the boy goes Telefonica. After rounding Mark II, Telefonica got their sheet caught in their spinnaker, and as they struggled to regain order on board, Puma began to haul them in. The Spanish boat managed to maintain a narrow lead and was soon flying once more, re-establishing and extending the gap over Puma. For the first time in an import sprint in this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race, protest flags were raised. On the way to Mark V, Camper and Sanya were inches away from disaster. Camper, the lured boat, incensed by Sanya's perceived failure to keep clear. 
back at the front of the pack, Telefonica cruised to its second in port victory in four races. Puma crossed in second, with Abu Dhabi in third. Lake 4, Sanya to Auckland. We knew where we were going, but I don't think anybody else did. Any idea what country we're in? I believe this is Japan. Japan. We were close to getting that sinking feeling. An epic battle under the shadow of the Harbour Bridge. Point six for mile. Sanya to Auckland and a sort of homecoming for most of the boys. A tropical cyclone in the South China Sea postponed departure for leg four by 18 hours, signifying the enormity of the challenge that lay ahead for the Volvo Ocean Race fleet. 5,200 nautical miles from China past the Philippines and down towards the city of sails, Auckland, New Zealand. The sheltered start soon replaced by some of the most extreme conditions the boats had witnessed so far. The South China Sea in winter is a tough challenge. The ideal route was directly to the Philippines through the Luzon Strait and then south towards New Zealand. But conditions were pushing the fleet in a more northerly direction towards the coast of Taiwan. Down in the navigation station on board Puma Ocean Racing's Mar Mostro, it was decision time, and the split from the fleet was in the offing. And what a split it was. New Zealand's down there. Japan's that way. Taiwan's there. Did I mention New Zealand's down there? Risky, maybe, but the risk paid off. Puma endured days of tough conditions but made big gains on the rest of the fleet. At the front of the pack, Group Armour and Camper were keeping a close eye on Puma's gains. The French boat reacted quickly, choosing to move north at the first opportunity. We needed to react relatively quickly to be able to head back north and control Puma, who had quickly proved to be the most dangerous boat. We couldn't have waited any longer and we committed to it. We headed north looking for the wind while Camper kept a middle-ish line. Now at that stage we, we thought we needed to get some southing as in start to get towards Auckland. Uh, they went pretty hard north of east, um, you know, and basically just went, went up and up and up and out to Puma and then down, and it was, the, it, you know, it was the right call. Having covered Puma, Group Armour extended their lead as the fleet passed through squally conditions on its way to New Zealand. Already past the potential wind shadows of the various South Pacific islands, Group Armour appeared safe. Behind the French boat, the battle for second place was hotting up with three of the fleet in serious contention, including runaway leaders Telefonica. To suddenly be in with a shot of getting second after a leg that had really been hard work for us, I think was a, a good morale boost. You know, it gave us a kind of goal to, to stick in there and see if we could pull a second or third place. Group Palmer was within sight of Auckland and its very first leg win when the crew sensed something was very wrong. I was upstairs uh, trimming the mainsail when I uh, saw that the bow was behaving a little bit strange. Uh, it seemed like the boat was digging into the water a bit more than normal. So I went downstairs to have a look in the bow and uh, discovered that we uh, had a lot of uh, water in the bow. All hands to the pump on Group Armour, as behind them Puma, Telefonica and Camper pushed on. The French crew worked hard to plug the hole in their hull and cruised into Auckland to a hero's welcome, their first leg victory of this race. It's always magical when you arrive at night. It was 11 o'clock on a Saturday night, so even when we were still sailing, we could hear the noise and we saw the crowd on dry land who were all looking out towards us. 
You arrive on a boat at the head of the fleet. It's a fantastic moment. And after taking a gamble early on, it was Puma Ocean Racing who arrived in second. The battle for the final podium place was going down to the last sprint into Auckland. After 5,200 nautical miles, less than two minutes separated Telefonica and Camper. That result also meant that Groupama moved up to overall second ahead of the Spanish Kiwi boat. In the Auckland import race, Puma got the perfect start at the committee boat end, while Abu Dhabi in the middle of the line also started well. One, Local knowledge soon kicked in as Camper tacked immediately towards the wall, finding the breeze on the city side of the course and significantly less negative current. Groupama and Sanya were quick to follow their move. When Camper tacked back out, they managed to cross in front of Puma, whilst behind them, Groupama and Sanya jostled for position, Mike Sanderson's team losing out and falling behind the rest of the fleet. Heading up to the first mark, the Kiwi Spanish boat overlaid the boy. Frank Camas's Groupama sailing team judged it to perfection, allowing them to overtake Puma and make up valuable ground on the leaders. Under the bridge, the fleet hit markedly lighter air in the shadow of Northcote Point. But Abu Dhabi's overly aggressive approach into Mark II cost them dearly as they lost control of their sail. That's on. Spinnaker all over the place. They pushed that on a mark hard. Puma and Groupama continued their tussle as the American boat took its turn to sneak past, while Stabu Dhabi was still trying to restore order down below. Camper's lead was unassailable, and Puma managed to hold off Groupama for second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Leg five, uh, Auckland to Itajay. You could say we were reluctant to leave Kiwi waters. You seeing water? Yeah. Leg five, if you were of the Southern Ocean. Get sick of this, The nuts and bolts of the situation. That's the Southern Ocean for you. was all going so well. It was a spectacular farewell to the City of Sales as the Volvo Ocean Race fleet departed Auckland surrounded by a flotilla of spectator boats. Ahead lay the longest leg of the race and potentially the toughest conditions the sailors had faced so far in this edition. The journey would comprise 6,700 nautical miles from New Zealand around Cape Horn and up to Itajaí in Brazil. And it didn't take long for the elements to take their toll. Bob's ran downstairs and, uh, and took a look, thinking it was probably the ram or a piece of rope had broken, but unfortunately the, the whole bulkhead that's glued into the boat had pulled out and, and hit the top of the deck, so uh, yeah, we knew it was serious. Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing turned back to Auckland. The other five boats ploughed on. The expected brutal conditions dangerous to both boats and bodies. Puma helmsman Thomas Johansson was smashed by a huge wave and dislocated his shoulder. It was up to onboard medic John Swain to relocate it. At this point, it had been an hour and a half and he hadn't spoken yet. He was in so much pain. He couldn't actually verbalise anything. And he just slowly moved his elbow out. He, he's just sitting there trying not to scream in pain. All of a sudden, his eyes open like, and it was like somebody just flicked a switch on his body. He's, he's alive. He's going to make it. As the fleet prepared itself for the rigours of the Southern Ocean, it was Team Sanya that assumed the lead. But as had so often been the case for the hardy crew of Sanya Lan, just when things were going their way... It was late at night. Um, the boat was going between 23 and 33 knots. And next minute, bang. Like, you know we're in trouble, bang. 
driven beach. The noise that came was the noise of water coming into the boat at speed. The rudder basically dropped out through the bottom of the boat. So, uh, you see the water there? Next minute, the one rudder that we had stalled, so we carved into this crash giant. And, um, which is kind of, you know, it's like, you've got to be kidding. So now we're on our side. Um, the one good rudder that we've had is 15 feet in the air. The, the hole is now buried in the water. If the watertight door had then failed, we would have sunk. Sonia had to turn and limp back to safe harbour in New Zealand under jury rudder. The severity of their damage gave them no chance to rejoin. They would have to ship, and not to Brazil, but to the USA to make repairs and ready themselves for leg seven from Miami. Cracks detected on board camper on the first night were giving cause for concern. The bulkhead had buckled and there was now worry over the structural longitudinals. We're slowly running out of options and material to fix it. Uh, we're still heading towards the uh, South American coast. Uh, we, we're, not, we're not quite at a pan pan uh, level yet which is an urgency just below uh, Mayday, but we do need to start making preparations in that direction so that it's no big surprise if it comes about. Rob Salthouse and his trusty power tools have managed to repair the boat sufficiently to consider a diversion as opposed to a retirement. We're currently about 2,300 miles from uh, our new destination, which is uh, Porto Mont in Chile. It's 800 miles um, north of Cape Horn. We kind of estimate um, uh, eight to 10 days for us to get there, and then uh, three days of work, and then we can resume, hopefully, racing to Itajai. Half the fleet was now wounded, but still the pounding from monster waves continued. Man over. Anywhere in this race is, is scary. And I've had two people fall over the side and managed to retrieve both of them, but that's been in warm water. In cold water, I, I don't think you get them back alive. With Sanya out, Camper diverted and Abu Dhabi trailing way behind, the leading trio reached the furthest point from land in the leg. A bad time for the Spanish team to discover damage to their bow, forcing them to slow. The potentially serious situation gave rise to a difficult decision for the race leaders. They were going to have to divert to Ushuaia in Argentina for vital repairs. It was one of those moments when we had to remind ourselves that we couldn't win the entire race in that one stage, but we could lose it. We evaluated everything and we thought that things would have to go really bad for us not to get on the podium in third. We couldn't run the risk of not pulling in, of not going for it. Back on the road again, Abu Dhabi was 500 nautical miles behind the fleet. We were just getting to the end of the, uh, the end of the ice gate, and all the while we were sort of rumbling along at good speeds, 20 plus knots, and uh, the guys on standby downstairs were, were doing a bit of tidying up when they heard a noise. Immediately we had to slow down and find the extent of the damage. It was damage to the core. The two carbon skins were moving independently and had to be secured. The Abu Dhabi team drilled 30 nuts and bolts through the hull and, like Camper, headed for Chile for further repairs. Up ahead, the two leaders had finally cleared the ice gates, left the Southern Ocean behind and headed for the most famous landmark in sailing. The honour of being the first boat around, Cape Horn fell to Group Armour, with Puma Ocean Racing not too far behind them. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Telefonica, the plans to pull into Ushuaia had been eclipsed by a shorter, faster strategy. Just 10 miles from Cape Horn, the race boat tied up to the shore cruise vessel and the repairs were effected at sea. Telefonica was quickly on its way again. <laughs> Thank you.
but passed the horn disaster had struck the group armor when they dismasted. Able to salvage sails and the damaged mast, they became the fifth boat in the fleet force to divert, this time to Punta del Este in Uruguay, hoping to get back on the racetrack as quickly as possible. Further up the South American coast, a delighted team Telefonica was flying and dreaming of the impossible, chasing down Puma, the only other boat on the race course. As we reached the end of the leg, again, we had some fantastic conditions, where the wind was much better for us than it was for Puma, and we just headed straight on, 100% without any stops. The boat was reaching very high speeds, and we caught up to Puma very quickly. A bizarre twist of fate meant the conditions strongly favoured the boat behind, and Telefonica was soon within sight of Puma and potentially a fourth leg victory. And here they come again. Damn blue boat. I hate that boat. Have I mentioned before I hate that boat? The weather gods at that stage were playing into our hands, and you know, in retrospect, I almost feel sorry for people. We were that close to being even. But the black cat dug its claws in and clung on for Puma's first leg victory. Just 13 minutes later, Team Telefonica crossed the line on board Brazilian Yoka Signorini, clearly delighted to be home. Amazing. I can't, I've never seen more people at a sailing event in my life than... Uh... I don't even know who these. I don't even know where I am right now, and, and, and these people seem to know us. So I guess we're in the right place. Unbelievable. Four days later, Group Home became the third team to complete the leg under sail, albeit somewhat reduced. At last, but by no means least, Camper back in the race and claiming fourth place in the leg and valuable points. Abu Dhabi arrived by ship and the race to get the boat ready was on. We've got 48 hours before we need to leave the dock for the import race, so, um, you know, it's, we, we started saying it was a five-day job, then we worked out how we could do it in 70 hours, and, you know, we've got to do it in 48 hours, so it's in the hands of the shore crew, and I'm quietly confident that they'll pull it off, but let's see. After surgery of both the major and minor variety, the fleet of five assembled on the start line for the DHL import race. Puma charged over the start line first, but failed to keep clear of lured boat Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing and was penalised. Telefonica made significant gains on the left-hand side of the course and the Spanish boat led at Mark 1. But just as the race was starting to look processional, an extraordinary mistake occurred. The usually faultless team Telefonica rounded what they thought was Mark IV, but incredibly, it was the wrong mark. The white mark is actually the start-finish line mark. The mark they should be hitting for is, in fact, um, an orange mark. As Telefonica scrambled to return to the correct course, the rest of the fleet pressed on, a quite incredible mistake from the Spaniards, costing them valuable points. The damage was done. Group Armour free to claim a vital six points ahead of Camper. Puma clawed their way back to third, keeping Abu Dhabi at bay. Leg six, Itajaí to Miami. The heat, the pressure, relentless. Leg six blew the race wide open. in the wrong place, wrong time, not so good. Chasing, chasing and so close. Are they just there? Six miles that way? All clear, all clear. As the fleet bade a fond farewell to Itajaí, hopes were high that leg six would prove less damaging to both boats and bodies, with the fleet heading north, hugging the South American coast before threading its way through the Caribbean islands and on to Miami, a journey of 4,800 nautical miles. The first tactical option in play was the inshore route versus the offshore route, which caused an immediate split in the fleet. 
ourselves and Camper ended up sailing a bit lower and, uh, and closer to the coast and, and the other guys sort of stayed a bit further offshore. And you know, one thing that's always really surprising with these boats is how quickly you'll suddenly create a massive separation. While Camper and Abu Dhabi's inshore route may well have been the correct tactical call, circumstances beyond their control meant that both boats lost rather than gained miles. It's a seismic vessel with 8,000 metres of cable out the back on the surface and these are two guard ships so we're in conversation. Basically, if you don't get across their bow, they can't stop. Unable to cross Ocean Explorer's bow, the inshore boats had to detour significantly from their preferred route in order to avoid the vessel's trailing equipment at a cost of at least five miles. Offshore, Puma Ocean Racing had new breeze and was extending over its closest competitors. It sort of happened the way we were hoping for. We, we managed to stretch out on the guys. Uh, we got into this better pressure than the guys behind us. And now we have uh, you know, a little lead coming into this next bridge. We're essentially in the southeast trades, which uh, will take us up to the top corner of Brazil. Telefonica was the next team to feel the benefit of the trade winds, while Abu Dhabi, having already lost miles inshore, was starting to feel under pressure from Groupama, who'd been temporarily slowed by a fishing route jammed around their keel. We started to feel that we were sort of struggling a bit for pace. We had, we had a period where we sort of seemed to be in less wind than the other guys. We were in less wind than the boats at front, and Groupama had more wind behind us, and, uh, yeah, we were sort of bleeding miles each scared, so we ended up... So maybe sailing a slightly lower road in the hope that it would, it would give us an opportunity to sort of be in a good position when we got further up in the Caribbean and uh, the boats would have to start driving down. As the leaders passed the island of Guadeloupe, the next big tactical decision was exactly when to make the turn to the west and begin passage through the Caribbean islands. Behind the leading pair, Telefonica had ground to a spectacular halt. Devastating for the Spanish team, but great news for Group Armour sailing up from behind. The guys behind had rather cleverly taken the opportunity to, to see what was happening and had made a big move to the, to the south and uh, were making massive gains um, and it was clear they were going to catch up the 80 to 100 miles that they were behind and, and, uh, and possibly overtake us. After passing Great Isaac, the final waypoint, Puma Ocean Racing could have been forgiven for thinking that the leg victory was in the bag. However, there was one more challenge ahead. We're pointing at the mark at the moment, but between us and the mark is, uh, is the Gulf Stream, which will have you know up to four knots of current in it, setting us sideways. So, so we're going to get swept downstream. We're just there, about... Um, Five, six miles that way, the upwind a bit, but we've closed it up a lot. Puma opted for a defensive move by turning south first in an effort to reduce the amount of head-on sailing into the Gulf Stream, and it worked. For the second consecutive leg, Marmostro crossed the line at the front of the fleet, an invaluable 30 points for the American team. show up in your hometown and it's something that I'm going to remember for the rest of my sailing career. It was, it was something that is special and um, you don't get to do that very often. Just over an hour later, Camper crossed the line claiming a crucial 25 points, but where was Telefonica? The final podium position was claimed five hours later when Group Armour crossed for third place in leg six now just 15 points behind Telefonica. Abu Dhabi finished fifth to conclude a leg that blew the competition wide open once again. As for Team Sanya, after shipping their boat to Georgia for repairs, the Chinese team was on its way to Miami to complete the fleet once more. Have a good flight. 
It's nice to be back on the boat, nice to be with the guys, and it's, uh, yeah, awesome to be back in it, saying goodbye to the family. It's a little practice for next week, so all good. The boats crossed the start line of the Port Miami Inport race in 16 knots of breeze, with Puma and Sanya leading off the pin end. Abu Dhabi led for most of the first leg, but it was Telefonica who laid the mark to perfection, rounding six seconds ahead of the Emirati boat, with closest rivals Group Armour in third. The French boat managed to roll Abu Dhabi on leg two to move up to second, and then captured the leaders on the short, sharp reach to mark three. But with only 80 seconds between first and sixth, it was clear that the race was far from over. As the breeze continued to fade, there was carnage at mark six when the four trailing boats came together. Telefonica was penalised for making contact with the mark, consigning them to last place, whilst Sanya also stalled and lost position to both Puma and Camper. As the race headed towards its conclusion, Ian Walker's team rolled Group Armour and managed to hold the lead until the finish for their third in-port race victory. Leg 7, Miami to Lisbon. The opportunities were there, we just didn't cash in. It's a game of angles. The things sometimes are not happening right. Miami to Lisbon. It was time for Azam, the Falcon, to fly. Leg 7 consisted of almost 3,600 nautical miles of Atlantic Ocean from southern Florida into the Gulf Stream and north, before turning east towards the Azores and finally Lisbon in Portugal. For the first time since Auckland, the fleet was whole once more as Sanya returned to the fold. Yeah, it's wonderful to be back in the race. I mean, um, the leg we had to retire from was one thing, but then to not be able to make it and even start um, in the import race um, in Etijar and, and the leg up to Miami, that, that was brutal. Leaving Miami at a gentle pace was quite literally the calm before the storm. Alberto was looming and his movements were proving difficult to read. was in danger of being swallowed up by the storm system. Looks like we might have got caught in the wrong side of this uh, system. It's not good, so um, guys were fast running. They were on the wind. So um, just riding it out. Saw a water spout before, that's not a good sign. Five of the six boats charged head-on into the depths of the tropical storm, but Group Armour predicted trouble ahead and took the decision to split from the fleet, avoiding the worst of the conditions. Jean-Luc and picked a great time to jive. Since then, all we've done is change sails. And, uh, and yeah, to no, no one's surprised, the Volvo fleet is now upwind again. The fleet tracked east, travelling on the remnants of Alberto's influence. Group Armour was the first boat to lose the storm's effect and the chasing pack wheeled them in. In front, Group Armour and Telefonica were extending on their easterly heading but starting to slow. Behind them, the chasing boats could see the drop in speed and continue to travel north in far better conditions. After initially seeking to join the northerly route, Telefonica's options were so limited that they were forced to jibe away again to the east, separating from the remainder of the fleet. Meanwhile, Abu Dhabi had called everything right. Patiently pursuing the northerly route, when the Emirati boat finally turned east, it picked up the bonus of the Gulf Stream, Ian Walker's team establishing a significant lead over the rest of the fleet. We'd made all the right decisions to get in the lead, and then you suddenly look at it and you think, this is a chance. This is a chance to get away. This is not about 
what we've been facing the rest of the race. This is, this is a weather situation where if you can get around the bottom of the high, you could end up 100 miles ahead. Luck was not on Telefonica's side as their leg went from bad to worse. I've been driving before and I've hit a, a whale and the boat stops so quickly, you, you, you fall over the wheel and break the wheel. We'd hit this one with the dagger board. The dagger board broke. We were lucky that the rudder wasn't damaged and we managed to carry on. Even considering these complications, we managed to carry on sailing and fighting for the lead. We were so lucky that the broken dagger board wasn't vital later on in the leg. Abu Dhabi's lead was unassailable, arriving in Lisbon for their maiden leg victory. Grupama had gained on the last part of the leg, but couldn't catch Ian Walker's team. I felt we deserved the leg win, you know. I, I felt that after the mistake in the tropical storm, which was made by five of the six boats in the fleet, I don't think we put a foot wrong. It's been five days of intense pressure with people catching us, catching us, catching us, and uh, we did it, we did it. I'm so pleased for Abu Dhabi, I'm so pleased for the team. With 25 points secured, Group Arma now had to wait to see the finishing order of their closest rivals. Two hours later, it was Puma Ocean Racing that claimed the final podium place. Third for Puma, and the Group Arma took the overall lead in the race for the first time. How big that lead would be depended on the developing battle between Telefonica and Camper coming up the river to the finish. For the third time in the race, Camper and Telefonica were locked in a duel and for the third time it appeared that Telefonica had the upper hand. We're just over here and I'd say we're probably not far off being equal distance to the finish and we've got slightly more pressure right now. Telefonica's fourth place meant that Puma Ocean Racing overhauled a disappointed Camper on the leaderboard. The leg belonged to a jubilant Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing, the overall lead to Gupama, but the Volvo Ocean Race was still wide open. Conditions were perfect for the start of the away Ras inboard race as the boats jostled for position in the pre-start. Telefonica tangled with Puma at the committee boat end of the line and the Empire's decision went against the Spanish boat, declared guilty of not sailing their proper course. And Telefonica have put Puma under the pump, the flags are flying, red flag, red flag. penalty. Camper and Group Armour immediately took advantage of their rivals' misfortune. As the leaders sailed underneath the 25th of April bridge, Camper and Group Armour had swapped the lead several times, but at Mark 1, it was the French boat in the ascendancy. Any hopes of a team Telefonica comeback were thwarted when they lost control of their spinnaker after their rounding, the sail acting as a giant break as the rest of the fleet sailed away. A beautifully judged victory for Group Armour, followed home by a delighted Puma Ocean Racing. Leg eight, Lisbon to Lorient. Now oh, that was a shakedown. The Bay of Biscay. What a ride. We thought it was all over. Lisbon to Lorient. We break. That's it. <laughs> It's still all there to play for. As the boats left Lisbon on the penultimate offshore leg of this edition of the race, it appeared as if perhaps the pressure was starting to take its toll, as both Telefonica and Grupama were off the pace, bringing up the rear as the fleet started its journey towards the Azores. Well, we knew that the eighth leg was important for us here in Europe. We knew that we had to fight for the overall result. In this leg, it was key for us to be close to Group Arma, to try and get in front of them, to reduce the points deficit. And if we did that, we'd be on even points and everything would be decided on the last leg. 
The shortest offshore leg so far saw the fleet leave Portugal and head west, back into the Atlantic Ocean to the turning point of San Miguel in the Azores, before sailing northeast towards Spain and across the Bay of Biscay to Loyal. The first obstacle to surmount was the Azores High. The pressure system caused compression and essentially a restart near the islands. It's OK. We're going strong. We have Group Arma at 500 metres, us and Puma, and Camper and Abu Dhabi are there also. So we're starting again. Telefonica led the fleet around Samuel as the boats began their return journey back to Europe. Standing in their way, this time was a huge low pressure system in the Bay of Biscay. The impending treacherous conditions occupied everyone's thoughts. The two principal contenders, Telefonica and Group Armour, were leading the charge into the storm. But it soon became clear that all was not as it should be on the French boat. A malfunction of the main halyard lock meant that the Group Armour mainsail was stuck at full hoist. Someone was going to have to scale the mast to release the lock, and that someone was bowman Brad Marsh. To be 30 metres up, at the top of the mast there um, in a sea state like that is like uh, being at the top of a fishing rod when someone casts it, you know. It's, uh, the base doesn't move very much, but the top is, is very exaggerated. Taking the knife out now. Yeah, I'm cutting the first one now. It truly was the most difficult moment of that leg. We were stressed when we had that problem. You're telling yourself that maybe it's over for this leg, and maybe even for the whole race. So for one hour I was telling myself, because of that little breakage in the mast, we might stupidly lose the Volvo. Uh, Marsh's surgery meant crisis averted for Group Armour, but no sooner had Telefonica taken advantage of their chief opponent's misfortune than they themselves hit a spot of trouble. I was grinding. I look at the echo and he goes, no rudder. The boat luffs up violently, um, feeling terrible. You think the rig's going to fall out of the boat, all the sails are going to destroy themselves in seconds. And then we got down to fitting the spare rudder that we carry on board, which was not a straightforward operation. The rudder was replaced from the outside, so a crew member with a harness had to be on the outside too, and we managed to pull the new rudder up and into place. With Group Armour bloodied but not bowed, Telefonica, back in the lead after replacing their rudder, was hoping to extend before an unwelcome sense of déjà vu struck. Down below, the guys heard the rudder break and fall off, but we didn't know on deck. Frightening is, is it doesn't really put it, but how violent and, and uh, chaotic the situation is. I ended up up to my neck in water. Two broken rudders and a damaged one in six hours. The worst thing is, we were racing for the regatta and our chances of winning are almost nil now. So anyway, a tough day, a difficult day. Of course, we're not happy, far from it. And now all that's left is to try and finish without losing the rudder so that we have some control and so that the boat can reach the port in good shape and so that all the crew can reach shore in one piece too. Telefonica's victory dreams hung in tatters as all the boats took a pounding with the sailors turned into human dominoes. You know, we've had it before where you get washed off hard enough that, um, you know, you just, take, you just take out that guy and sometimes two guys behind you and, you know, and people are left battered and bruised. Brad Marsh's Spider-Man heroics had saved the day for Group Armour as they sailed towards their home port at the head of the fleet, saluted on their way by the Patrouille de France. <laughs> Be 
behind, the French boat camper's crew had regained their feet and snuck into second place, but were still working hard to keep the charging cat at bay. Ahead, a jubilant group armour recorded their second leg win, and more importantly, the vital maximum 30 points. For us, it's been a superb leg. We dreamed about victory in Lorient. It, it wasn't easy. The last 24 hours were very hard and stressful. We played with fire yesterday evening, but everything's OK now. All's well, and we're happy, and the welcome here is just fantastic. Just an hour later, Camper arrived in Lorient, a job well done for the Spanish-Kiwi combination and 25 points in the bag. And a mere 13 minutes later came Puma Ocean Racing, a little disappointed that they couldn't finish higher on the podium. Victory meant Groupama were now 28 points clear of Telefonica. To make matters worse, the Spaniards were down to joint third overall, level with Camper. Conditions off the coast of the sailing mad town of Lorient were perfect for the Britannia import race. The fleet assembled for its penultimate inshore battle. Two, one, now. A split developed on the first leg with Puma, Camper and Telefonica on the left side of the course. And when the fleet converged, Camper had managed to maintain their advantage, rounding mark one ahead of Groupama with Puma in third. As the fleet headed downwind, the Americans and French were absorbed in their own personal battle, allowing Camper to extend their lead by the second mark. Puma rolled around the bow of Groupama but failed to sheet in its Genoa, and the overall race leaders sailed through to Leward. Kitty Reed fights with the helm. The Genoa is look, the Genoa is not sheeted on. This will open up another opportunity for Group Armour. Heading homewards with the race seemingly taken care of, disaster struck for Camper. A misjudgment on board meant they chose a poor ley line. Group Armour nailed the mark and rolled over the top of the Spanish Kiwi team. With a veritable armada of spectator boats following them, race leaders Group Armour crossed the finish line to claim six points. Camper took second place, with Puma in third. <laughs> Leg nine. Leg nine, Lorient to Galway. Lorient to Galway. Lorient to Galway. With Group Armour's massive lead, the remaining podium positions would be decided on the final offshore leg. A pre-start penalty on departure day didn't help Camper's cause. We needed to be on the front foot from the get-go. I had a huge concern that we we're just going to see other teams stretch away from a mistake that I that I did. The last leg of just 500 nautical miles saw the fleet leaving Lorient and cross the English Channel round Fastnet Rock and sail up the western coast of Ireland into Galway. Only six points separated Camper, Puma and Telefonica, and as the fleet weaved its way through the islands off the northwest coast of France, they were all within sight of each other. Approximately halfway, Puma Ocean Racing led the fleet towards the iconic Fastnet Rock. We snuck ahead of the group overnight, but sneaking ahead doesn't mean a whole lot because I could almost hit him with my three iron right behind us. Uh, but we're rounding the infamous Fastnet Rock, which is always very, very cool. With both Puma and Telefonica in front of them and Group Armour within shouting distance, Camper took the decision to round as close to the rock as possible to try and get the vital inside track that set us up to stay above Group Armour all the way up to the point and, and that kept us above Telefonica and that set us up. With the leading four boats still impossible to separate, the big manoeuvre of the leg, the jive east to Galway, proved to be pivotal. 
Group Armour made the decisive move just moments before Camper followed suit. We we're going to be the boat to jive first, or we we're just going to go the same same time as, as those guys. In fact, we were we talked about it for 20 minutes before Group Armour had jived. Group Armour jived, we went, you know, probably within a minute or two of them. That was the call of the race for us right there. That move was sufficient to push Camper into what turned out to be an unassailable lead, a move which would have a lasting effect on the overall leaderboard. Unfortunately, the last 30 miles were quite light and easy, and it became a processional type of race. The faces on Telefonica told their own story. After leading for 38,000 miles around the globe, they weren't even going to step onto the podium. To think I was coming in here was that some of the other finishes where we've had it all go wrong for us right at the last. And we had, we had a bit of a shift, but all good. Really cool. Second place for Group Armour ensured the French team on their Volvo Ocean Race debut was going to claim overall victory, the culmination of a lifetime's ambition for Frank Camas and his crew. But the drama wasn't over just yet. We just got to the point where we are feeling a little bit comfortable finally. And then uh, there we came to a crashing halt. OK, let's get someone on a torch, one of pots. And next minute, whoo, they stopped. And um, they hooked a cray pot, and then it was pretty much over from then. Just over 37 hours and 40 minutes after leaving Lorient, Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand had crossed the finish line to seal their maiden leg victory and 30 points, sufficient to claim second place overall. Group Armour sailing team only needed to finish fourth to secure the overall trophy, but Frank Camus's men don't know how to give anything other than 100%. Third into port was Puma Ocean Racing, safe in the knowledge that they would be on the overall podium in Galway. The arrival of Team Telefonica in fourth position was tinged with regret. A clearly devastated E.K. Martinez left to rue what might have been. It's like we, uh, we have a chance to, to do a good leg and, um, and we didn't take it. So uh, fourth place is uh, what we merit is where we are. So uh, that's it, that's over. So, Sanya, well, the old girl came good in the end, just as Mike Sanderson had promised, and the Galway crowd had stuck around to cheer her in. Mixed emotions for Ian Walker and the Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing team. Despair at the result, but delight at the warm reception as Ian was reunited with daughter Zoe on her birthday. To come round, round the corner and see the sheer volume of people there was amazing. Like, none of us had ever experienced that crowd like that, and certainly I haven't, and I just remember thinking at the time, if there's ever a Volvo Ocean race lead to win, this was the one. Well, it's incredible, because I know that the victory will stay with me for the rest of my life. Even if I win another one, it's the first one that will stay. It's also the most surprising. You don't imagine that you'll ever win your first Volvo, particularly when you're considered an outsider, which means less pressure, maybe. The result makes us proud. We fought to be on the podium. But we'd already gone around the world. After that, it's just more happiness. So it was a nice moment as we got closer, especially to winning the Volvo. It only happens once in a lifetime, if it happens. So it's not something that we'll forget.
The Volvo Ocean Race 2011-2012 drew to a close with the Discover Ireland import race and Camper with Emirates Team New Zealand was sharpest off the line. Fleet split immediately. Puma, Sanya and Groupama headed off on port in search of better pressure, and it worked. The black cat in the lead when the fleet converged and first around Mark 1. There were no positional changes on the approach to the top mark, but Camper, forced to dip Groupama, laid the mark to perfection and overtook the French boat. Behind Puma, the battle for second raged on. Group Armour made gains and sailed the red boat away from the mark. Camper electing to go all the way across to the opposite gate, forcing a split and taking a gamble. Camper now have elected not to go around the same mark as Group Armour, but coming all the way across the gate to the right-hand mark. And uh, that's a, a fine piece of sailing by the French team. At mark six, Camper had starboard advantage and Camera stayed out of trouble, but a slow tap from the red boat allowed Group Armour to roll through on the leeward side. As Puma headed for victory in both the race and the overall import series, an uncharacteristic sail handling error from Group Armour allowed Camper to sneak around them, finishing the race in second place. To make matters worse, a big windshield saw Telefonica come through for third ahead of the French boat. All that remained was the presentation of the Volvo Ocean Race Trophy. It promised to be the closest race ever, and it proved to be just that. And the victors? Group Armour Sailing Team, who will write another chapter in the glorious history of the Volvo Ocean Race. Thank you for